Good evening and welcome to the 2020 Crystal Knock Commemoration Program. I've had the pleasure of sponsoring this program for the past 20 years, and every year is different. In that time, commemorations have taken in the form of orchestras, concerts, survivor presentations, and panels. They touched on topics from refugees to modern anti-Semitism, a topic which our community knows all too well. As the first all-digital Kristallnacht commemoration, this program is unlike any that we have ever done before. Even as we remember Kristallnacht, a time marked by the beginning of such darkness, we should take comfort in all that we have done to make this date where we bring our community together, the ultimate triumph in the face of attempted annihilation. This year also marks the 40th anniversary of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, an organization whose presence seeks to bring that sense of triumph to every day, making anniversaries and ensuring we never forget what happened while preserving the voices of those who survived the horrors of the Holocaust. I've had the privilege to serve as the chairman of the Holocaust Center from 1999 to 2001, and had been involved with the center's programming for many of these 40 years. In fact, I chaired the Holocaust Center's opening event back when the opening was at the JCC, and they were first sharing the French Vichy artifacts with the public. I'm so pleased that you'll get a chance tonight to hear more about that collection from its owner, Ed Friedman. Over the years, I've gotten to know many of the local survivors. They have become close personal friends of mine. Many of them are no longer with us. Reflecting on their absence this evening, it is a reminder that as each year passes, remembrance becomes even more important. As we learn their stories, we become a situation as witnesses where we are in turn tasked with carrying these experiences with us and making sure that they are passed down from generation to generation. I remember in the years when I was chair of the center, a program like this probably would have consisted almost entirely of survivors. That's no longer feasible. But that having been said, there was a time when a pandemic, such as we are in right now, might have kept us from gathering together. That's not the case tonight, because of technology has made it that tonight is still feasible. For all that we have lost, we have also gained. It has never been easier to get access to survivor testimony, to learn what happened during the Holocaust, and to carry on the vital task of remembrance. I hope you will take it upon yourself to do so. Thank you. If there are COVID silver linings, uh, certainly one of them is that you're able to participate in our program tonight. Um, after many years of scheduling conflicts that seemed insurmountable, but now we can get by because it's like you're in the same room as us right now. Thank um, you. I feel that 20... way. <laughs> oh, it's, it's wonderful. And after 20 years of supporting this program, we get to have you be here with us as part of the program. So um, I, I love it. And I'm so happy you do this with us this evening. Um, and I want to thank our intrepid staff and board at the Holocaust Center for continuing to deliver important programs for the community and as always, the Jewish Federation and all of the generous funders of the Holocaust Center. Uh, we had over 400 people sign up to participate in this program as we commemorate the November 1938 pogrom, which is also known as Kristallnacht. Um, slowly but slowly, we'll be able to use different language for it. Kristallnacht is the language that the Nazis used for this event. And as always, we try to get away from using language that comes from the Nazis. Um, for anyone here, um, I have not had the pleasure of meeting. I'm Lauren Barron's father, and I'm director of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. The Holocaust Center connects the horrors of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism with injustices of today. Through education, the Holocaust Center empowers individuals to build a more civil and humane society. And as you heard from Edgar Snyder, we are currently marking our 40th year. In a time of deep divisions in our world, Holocaust education has the power to bridge political divides, to inspire so-called adversaries to work together to form a more engaged society. The Nazi practice of divide and conquer pitted groups within a society against one another, leading people with many interests in common to see each other as adversaries and to see the Jews as less than human. Kristallnacht reminds us of where this kind of thinking can lead. 
My wish for all of us is that we continue to see each other's common humanity and that we remain especially attuned to the unabating persistence of anti-Semitism and racism in our time. Following the formal program tonight, we will take audience questions. Um, and now um, I have the honor of introducing our 2021 Holocaust Educator of the Year. The Holocaust Educator of the Year Award was created in 2016 to promote and recognize local Holocaust educators who inspire critical thinking and personal growth through their teaching. It is my pleasure to recognize Jim Luco with this year's Holocaust Educator of the Year Award. He has been a leader among Holocaust educators for decades, and we're impressed that he never stops learning, recently completing a master's degree at Graz in Holocaust studies, for which he traveled the country visiting Holocaust memorials. Jim Luco has taught AP US government and honors US history for the last 20 years at Seneca Valley High School. He also created a Holocaust studies course, which he teaches at Butler Community College. He began his professional career as a registered nurse, but made the career change to pursue his lifelong passion of history. When school is not in session, Jim volunteers at his children's school and multiple veterans programs, including Honor Flight Pittsburgh. For this reason, it is especially fitting that we recognize his many accomplishments the day before we mark Veterans Day. It is my pleasure now to turn the mic over to Mr. Jim Luco to teach us about the November 1938 program. Thank you very much, Lauren. I'm extremely humbled and very, very honored to do this. Um, it's very, very special to me and thank you. Martin Luther in this essay in 1543 wrote, the synagogues of the Jews should be set on fire and to be done, this should be done for the honor of God. The anti-Semitism that existed then will progress all the way till 1938, when it'll make a massive transition uh, on the night we're recognizing this evening. The Nuremberg Laws will be the cornerstone of the legalized persecution of the Jews. It will separate them from a religion to a race defined by blood. The Nuremberg Laws of 1933 were enacted 42 separate laws. In 1934, there were 19 more, and 29 more followed in 1935. These laws will result in the thorough elimination of the citizenship and the identity of the German Jew. Kristallnacht will be the turning point from repression to violence by the Nazi regime. Prior to Kristallnacht, there were several hundred foreign correspondents and journalists throughout, Germ or the, throughout the German Reich uh, to document and photograph what is about to occur. In October of 1938, Hitler began a program of eliminating foreign-born Jews. Polish Jews, Polish-born Jews were physically removed by the Gestapo in order to leave by gunpoint in one day. Two of these individuals were Herschel Greenspan's parents. Um, he will learn about that, and over the following weeks, he will obtain a firearm, and he will go to the German embassy and assassinate Ernst von Braun. And this was known throughout the world. Ordinary people outside of Germany and other democratic nations were now going to be exposed to what the real Nazism actually was. Beyond these actions listed here, an estimated 70 Jewish men were executed in Buchenwald as a lethal response and an indicator of what is about to become. If you read the last part, schools were mot uh, were, um were mobilized with their teachers to go observe and participate. And there was a uh, foreign uh, journalist who saw that and said there was no expression of shame or disgust. This picture is very powerful and German pedestrians are gonna glance and laugh at the broken windows of a Jewish owned shop in Berlin after the attacks. Um, if you see those two individuals smiling and laughing, I think it would be different if that was in 1933. I think five years and nine months of continued oppression and the removal of the humanity and all the individual characteristics which made the Jews uh, uh, humans as that was being taken away 
made it much easier for people like that to look down and accept what was about to happen. This is the burning synagogue at Frostenstrasse, Berlin. And these events were widely reported and photographed around the world and throughout America, not only in the major newspapers, but in the small town papers as well. This photograph is extremely powerful to me. You can see the SS guards forcing the Jews arrested during Kristallnacht to march to the town of Baden-Baden. The amount of spectators, the way they dress and their expressions are always chilling. Also, I always think about who took the photographs. And you could see small children watching, and it's in broad daylight. And at the end of the war, when people were going to discuss what they knew and who knew what, it would be very, very difficult to say you didn't understand what this was going on because this was happening in every town through the main thoroughfares um, and people watching this, photographing it. Um, it was amusement. This is the interior of the destroyed synagogue at Heckigan, and uh, you can see where the Torah was taken. This is one of the pictures of the school children taking out, and you can see the SS man standing there watching as uh, all the religious objects in the Torah taken from the Zevin synagogue are set on fire. This is another powerful picture of the Orgenstadt uh, synagogue as it burns, and the firefighters were definitely present, and you can see what they're doing. Instead of saving the synagogue, they're saving the nearby house as they were ordered to, to procure all German property and local residents watch as this synagogue is destroyed. Um, I, I don't know how anyone could say they didn't understand what was happening at that time. Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi Reich propaganda minister, kept a diary throughout uh, his time in the Reich. He further wrote in his diary, quote, the German people is anti-Semitic. It has no desire to have its rights restricted or to be provoked in the future by parasites of the Jewish race. The next day on November 10th, British journalist Hugh Green, who was president of Germany at the time, wrote that he never witnessed anything as nauseating as this, and it put the final seal on the outlawing of German Jewry. There was an American tourist in, in uh, Vienna who took this picture. Interesting thing about this report for SS uh, second in command Reinhard Heydrich and you can look at that amount of destruction. That was all done in 24 hours. You can see here how the residents watched the burning of the ceremonial hall next to the Jewish cemetery in Graz, Austria, uh, broad daylight. No one's trying to get water, no one's trying to help, no one's doing anything the normal things would people do if they saw a fire. A survivor, Ida Rudley, was 16 years old. She described it like this. She said the SS were completely free like a bird, free to do anything that they wanted to do with us. You could hear in the night people yelling for help, and nobody helped, no police or anybody. Another survivor, Kurt Kupferberg, who thought about escaping Germany, uh, was 21 years old. But he said that his inside voice said to him that he can't go and save his own skin. You have to be with your parents. You can't run away. This is the interior of a private home in Vienna, Austria. And many of the survivors said that the Gestapo and the SMS men came uh, with axes and saws and it was chaos and anarchy. Um, that's very disturbing to see someone's private home like that. This is a very powerful picture as well. If you look at the, at, the, at the crowd and look at people around, you can see a small boy on the right. You can see an SS man on the left laughing. Um, these are Jewish women in Linz, Austria, exhibited with cardboard signs that state, I've been excluded from the national community, and the two men behind them are cutting their hair off, um, 1938. Here, German civilians watch as the furnishing of the Mosbach synagogue is burned right in the town square. If you get a magnifying glass, you can see very, very few men in uniform and many, many civilians, uh, many of them laughing and smiling. Um, that's extremely disturbing. 
Survivor Susan Newlander Falker was 17 years old, and she summarized it like this. I was walking over the sidewalks with glass crunching under my feet, and on the next street, the Fossenstrasse, the oldest synagogue in Berlin, was in flames. The fire trucks were there, training their hoses on the neighboring houses, but letting the synagogue burn. And the entire sidewalk across from the synagogue was filled with hundreds of people, as if it was like a carnival to them, applauding and laughing, flames lighting up the sky and the people standing in reflected light in the glow of the flames laughing. I tried to walk past them in such a way that they wouldn't see that I was crying. She made it home. She vomited in her kitchen. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That was so powerful. And I'm always struck by the power of hearing individuals' observations and their stories and the experience of one person. So thank you for doing that in such a thoughtful way. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Wow. So at the Holocaust Center, we get to work with incredible community partners. And for tonight's program, we owe a debt of gratitude to Catherine Spitz-Cohan and the tour de force that is Film Pittsburgh. Thank you to Catherine and Film Pittsburgh for directing us to the film An Irrepressible Woman which would have been part of a bricks and mortar J Film Festival in Pittsburgh last spring, and for providing us access to the platform that will be used for the J Film Festival, which begins tomorrow. So I hope that everyone who's joining us is aware that this wonderful program is happening starting tomorrow and then lasting for more than a week. Catherine joins us this evening to talk about the film An Irrepressible Woman and the educational power of film in general. Catherine Spitz-Cohen has been Executive Director of Film Pittsburgh since 2001, overseeing programs including Pittsburgh Shorts, the J Film Festival, Real Abilities Pittsburgh, Teen Screen, the Robinson Short Film Competition, and the recently added Three Rivers Film Festival. Previously, Ms. Spitz-Cohen was Artistic and Education Director of Shakespeare in the Schools at the University of Pittsburgh, where she also taught for the Cat School of Business, Film Studies Program, and the Department of Theater Arts. Previously, she served as Assistant Director of Administration for the Three Rivers Arts Festival. In 2004, Ms. Fitzcohan was named as one of the city's top 50 cultural forces in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. In 2012, she received an Opal Award from Women in Film and Media Pittsburgh for exemplary professional achievement and contributions to the economic and cultural development of the region. Catherine serves on the board of Film Festival Alliance and is a graduate of Northwestern University. Um, Catherine, I can't thank you enough. Please join us. Hi, everyone. I am deeply honored to be here tonight and to, to work with the Holocaust Center and partner with you, Lauren. It is always just a great experience. And I feel strongly that that is um, why we do what we do. So uh, thank you for reaching out to me. Uh, as you mentioned, this film would have played in the film festival uh, at JFilm last April. And when you approached me uh, to think of a film in a way that we might partner for tonight, um, I was uh, very glad that you um, thought this film would be a good fit. It's not um, about Crystal Knocked per se, um, but I love the story for a number of reasons. And I'll get into that in a second. But I, I do want to say that I think that film is such an incredible tool, a supplement to learning. And so, um, James, I'm uh, very, you know, I'm, I'm very honored to be talking um, at the same time as you, you're a scholar. I, I'm not a scholar, I'm a film lover. And I, um, I get the fun job of being able to share film and use it as a jumping off point to talk about difficult um, subjects and um, to use it uh, especially with young people and we do this through our teen screen program where we show films and students respond 
uh, in a way that I know I as, a, as an adult do, but many people do, which is because film is a visual medium and we, uh, it's so accessible and everybody um, you know, can watch a movie, it's a way to grab people with a subject matter that they may not have ever heard of. And that was the case for me with this film. Um, I, of course, had heard of Leon Bloom, but I did not know the story about uh, Jean, uh, Jeannot Bloom. Um, and I have seen so many Holocaust films over the course of my time um, in my position. And um, there can never be enough Holocaust films. Uh, there should always be Holocaust films made so that the memory is never ended. And um, this film was a love story. I didn't know this love story. And I thought it was so different and so unique. Uh, and I, I was appreciative of the fact that I was able to learn about this. And I look forward to talking with you further uh, after this program to hear your questions and thoughts about the film. Um, I want to let you know that the film is based on a book. The screenplay was uh, based on a book by Dominique Messica, and the name of the book was I Promise You I Will Return. The, the film in French, the title was different, and I understand it's because uh, the filmmakers did not know how to translate the word irrepressible, that it would not be a good translation. Uh, but the, the French title translated is, I only dream of you. And that's the song that Jeannot sings with the singer in the film, I only dream of you. Uh, I was so um, moved by the lead actor's um, uh, performance. We have seen her in many films uh, that we've shown. So I've, uh, she's a, a, all of these actors are very well known in France, um, but I thought she just did an amazing job um, portraying her character. And the other thing that I was very surprised by in this film was the Himmler's Lodge, which was right next door to Buchenwald. And um, who knew? I had no idea that there was a um, sort of a, a, you know, a nicer, um, you know, a, a place where uh, notables were kept. So uh, in case they could negotiate their release. Um, so that was interesting to me. Uh, like I said, I, I'm not here to talk um, you know, to tell you any more of the film, I'm actually interested in hearing what you all um, have thought about it. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't also plug our J film track in the festival that opens tomorrow night. More of the films that we would have shown in April uh, will be shown and I hope you'll be able to join us. Thank you so much again to Lauren and her incredible team at the Holocaust Center. It is my great pleasure to be here and to talk with you and see so many of you um, here joining us tonight. So thank you. Catherine, thank you so much. And as you said, uh, this movie is not about Kristallnacht, uh, but yet we're able to find a lot of connections. So I'm going to draw those out a little bit. And then we have a video with a local scholar who's done extensive research in France um, in a, an area, a town just north of Paris called Amiens. And in his research, he has found some connections that we're going to hear about. So um, as you heard, I'm not sure how many of you were able to watch the film, but I hope many of you have seen it. It takes place in France, as you heard. It is in Germany for a little bit of the film. It tells the story of Leon Blum and his devoted paramour and future wife, Jean Reichenbach. Um, it's an unusual Holocaust story featuring a politically prominent French Jew, a former prime minister, and his experience during the Nazi occupation of France and imprisonment, as you heard from Catherine, at Himmler's hunting lodge, which was at Buchenwald, separated from the infamous concentration camp by a fence. I mean, yards from the concentration camp. And in the film, they talk at one point about the smell that on some days they have a there's a terrible smell coming from the other side of the fence. 
prior to Kristallnacht and before the beginning of the war, Nazi Germany had annexed Austria and occupied part of Czechoslovakia. As Jim Luco told us, German Jews experienced five years of oppression and intimidation leading to Kristallnacht. With the annexation of Austria and that part of Czechoslovakia, Nazi anti-Jewish policies were applied on day one. So uh, those occupations happen in 1938, and the danger arrives along with the Nazis. And Jim included one photo from Vienna. So in his presentation, without us talking about this beforehand, uh, we saw evidence of Crystal Knox effect in Austria as well. Early on in the film, An Irrepressible Woman, uh, there is a view of a hallway in a hotel in Bordeaux overflowing with refugees. So um, historian David Rosenberg in this video um, is going to draw out those connections uh, by looking at specific people, refugees who fled Germany and Austria to find themselves caught up by the Nazis in France. So um, a little bit more about David before we roll this video. Uh, some of you probably know him. He's well known around town. He has his bachelor's degree from Columbia University, a PhD in French history from Yale. Um, his dissertation was about Amiens, and that is how he got to know this town in France and has had a lifelong really fascination with it. It began not studying the Jews there, but rather Protestants there. And then he went on to discover that there was a whole Jewish population, uh, the memory of whom is pretty much lost to history, and he brought it back to life through his research. So um, he has a very lengthy bio, which I want to get us to the video, but I will say that his work in Amiens about the Jews who lived in Amiens became an exhibit which was displayed at Temple Emmanuel first, then at the Holocaust Center. It's been at the library at Pitt, and it is also online. You will find the links um, in the video, and we will be happy to provide them when we air this again as a recording. So. Um, Please, let's, let's watch this short video now with David Rosenberg. I want to say thanks to the Holocaust Center for hosting my exhibit on the Jews of Amiens, a photo exhibit where I had uh, discovered 41 photo identification cards of Jews from Amiens in the Somme region, just north of Paris, about an hour. Jewsofthesum.com, www.jewsofthesum, S-O-M-M-E dot com. The people that we'll be talking about briefly here today were, were not part of the photo fiche collection, which took place in 1942, because they were only in Amiens from 1938, roughly, to 1940. So by the time the photo ID cards were made in 1942, in June, they were elsewhere. And after the Germans occupied Amiens and moved on to Paris in May of 1940, they didn't lose any time inventorying the Jews in the area. They made two lists. The two lists were drawn up with the help of the French civilian authorities. So um, on, the, on those two lists, if you combine them, there were 18 people who came from either Germany or Austria. Now, the, the, Germ the Germans are, present an interesting case. One of them has a direct connection to Kristallnacht. This was a man by the name of Kurt Steinart. He has actually a close connection to Kristallnacht. He lived in Dresden, Germany, east, eastern part of Germany. His family owned a department store. He had a brother who was in partnership with in the department store. And he himself married uh, Sonia, who was a sales girl in the, in the department store. And they had, um, they had two children. There's a picture of him with one of his children, um, Marianne, in 1931 in Dresden. And then later on, there was another girl named Gert, who was born in 1937. Well, the, the connection uh, of the Steinart family with Kristallnacht is this. His brother, Werner, was actually the last groom married in one of the chief synagogues of Dresden. That was on November 5th, 1938. And three days later, the synagogue was destroyed during the Kristallnacht outbreak. And uh, Kurt himself was um, arrested in the pogrom that accompanied the destruction of the synagogue. And he was sent to the concentration camp of Buchenwald. Eventually, he was offered the option of, of emigrating and being liberated. So that's how, he, that's how we know he came to France 
And he went to Paris, and uh, from there he got to Amiens. Back in, the wife and daughter, two daughters stayed back in Germany, but they in turn got arrested and deported, and, and they died in Auschwitz the year after he did. But no, he's, he died in June of 1942, and they went over in, in uh, 1943. Because we, we don't have any really first-hand information from most of the most of the refugees. What looks pretty clear is that some of them went to Paris. All right, they were in Paris before they were in Amiens, and Amiens is uh, 75 miles or so north of Paris. Um, so it wasn't far away. But you know, why did they come to Amiens? It's been something of a mystery. We really have one one significant item of information about that, which may or may not apply to, to, to all of the people. Um, this is a letter that I found in the synagogue archives in, in Amiens. Uh, it was a letter that was written by a fellow named Paul Kammerman. And Paul Kammerman was, was born in Budapest and was listed as an Austrian. And in 1963, Kammerman wrote to Mr. Lair the president of the Amiens synagogue in German to ask him for some help with some pension claims that he had against the Austrian government. And to, to refresh um, Mr. Lair's memory, he lists various events that occurred to him during the time between about 1938 and 1940. And in, the, in this letter that he wrote, he has this one phrase which has been very interesting. The prefect from Paris, the police officer in Paris, sent me to Amiens as uh, specifying Amiens as my compulsory residence at the end of 1938, since I was a former Austrian. Well, so this, this turns out to be quite interesting. This is not when the Germans had, had beaten the French, had defeated the French yet. This is before that. This is 1938. To, so it was the French who wanted, he's Clamp cameraman, he says, who wanted him to be located in Amiens. In general, people can't figure out why any of these people fetched up in Amiens. So uh, I can't tell you for sure that this is the, um, the definitive answer, this, this um, sentence from Paul Cameraman's chronology, but it looks like it. There, it might have been a question of um, people being assigned by the French government to live there. Um, I was able to track down the, the destinies of, of 11 of the people, uh, 11 of the adults uh, who, were, who were refugees. They all went to Auschwitz and only one, this Paul Kammerman, uh, he's the only one that survived after being moved around from one camp to the next. Uh, there's a good picture of him at the, on the uh, website of the Memorial of the Shoah. In, France, in Paris. So you had all these refugees. They were there in 1938, registered in September and October of 1940. And then in December, December 2nd and 3rd of 1940, they were expelled from Amiens by order of the German authorities. And some of them went to work camps. They, and it seems that others were maybe sort of not taken into custody, but went to Paris and then tried to hide out. Uh, Paul Cameron's letter describes some of where he went. Uh, and not, not only the refugees, but then later on, people who had left Amiens were also in different parts of Paris. So I think, you know, the way in which the, um, the city remembers its, and even the, the Jewish community remembers its uh, martyrs, um, is more based on who got taken away from there. When the, when the final memorial tablet got erected in 1948, it didn't include them. Uh, in fact, I don't think people necessarily knew what happened to them. But we know now because of the work that's been done since Serge Klarsfeld and others, what happened to, what happened to the Jews of France. They were they they just a lit in Amiens for two years. They were birds that light on the telephone wires, and then they were gone. And you know there was a possibility 
uh, the, the, they were remembered, you know, for a while. But in 1948, they kind of fell off the memorial tablet. And, you know, all of the Jews fell off the, you know, memory, the erase board of the, uh, the city for a long time. And, you know, there's, there's been a rediscovery and some very, you know, a lot of the rediscovering has been done by non-Jews there. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, there's, there's a lot of credit to go around to. There, there's a lot that's obscure about the refugees. And, uh, you know, I don't have, we don't have pictures of any except three of these refugees that I'm talking about. Steinart, um, Tilly Offenkraut, and, uh, and, and Paul Kammerman. I haven't seen pictures of any of the others. But in the, in the archives, including the registry where they had to appear before the police and sign their names, there's their signatures. And you at least have a, a trace of the humanness um of them. You know, I know that people say they like stories, you know, and stories are the way to teach. But, but sometimes you just have traces. I am really moved by this research, which um, really recovered the record of all of these people in Amiens who would have been completely forgotten by history. And um, as, as I like to tell David Rosenberg whenever I'm talking to him, I think of him as, a, as the best kind of troublemaker because he discovered this archive in Paris and then went back to Amiens and, and gave it back to them and insisted that they included in their archive and insisted that these stories be told and these people be remembered. And when he talks about the signature that he found, and that was to him proof that this person existed, um, it, it leads us nicely into the last part of our formal program before we get into the Q&A. And I want to thank everyone who's already putting questions into the Q&A feature. I look forward to getting to those shortly. Um, so we're going to conclude with remarks from Ed Friedman. Um, Ed Friedman has been involved with the Holocaust Center um, for many years, and you heard from Edgar Snyder that Edgar remembers when the Holocaust Center debuted these artifacts, which are owned by Ed and his family and are on long-term loan with the Holocaust Center. Um, we recorded a video with him telling the story of his discovery slash recovery in France of artifacts from the Holocaust. And um, what he discovered echoes in the film and also in what we just heard from David Rosenberg. So I'll tell you a little bit about Ed Friedman and then we're going to hear from him. He is a lawyer in Pittsburgh with extensive experience litigating complex civil and commercial cases at both the trial and appellate levels in state and federal court. And beyond that, I think we see some hints as to what makes him interested in all of this. Um, he speaks three languages, and I know for a fact that he studies a fourth. So it's actually four languages, including English, French, Italian, and Turkish. He was in the Peace Corps in Turkey. He lives part of the year when it's not COVID in France. Um, and he has a long and interesting history of being in different places around the world and taking an interest in what happens in the world around us. So um, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to share this with you. It is basically a virtual tour of the artifacts that you would be able to see if you were visiting the Holocaust Center in person. And I look forward to a time when we can display them in a space large enough to accommodate everyone who's participating in this program. As part of this uh, Kristallnacht commemoration, we concentrated, of course, on the importance of memory so that future generations can begin to understand what happened to the Jewish people and the attempt to eradicate the Jewish people during the Second World War. We must be vigilant so that the decades-long promise of never again continues into the future for Jews and other oppressed peoples. My wife Judy and I had the opportunity more than 20 years ago to discover artifacts from the Shoah in France, which we were able to obtain and bring to Pittsburgh. These artifacts are now on display at the Holocaust Center here in Pittsburgh and certainly serve as valuable educational tools for young Pittsburgh students and for adults as well, as seeing the real artifact is always more powerful than seeing a copy or a film. During one of the many trips I made to France, I was invited with friends to a sh visit a chateau, which I didn't realize at the time was on what is called the Ligne de Démarcation, in English, the line of demarcation. To explain the location, 
you must know that after the Germans occupied France in 1940, they divided the country between occupied France in the north and what they called free France in the south. Free France became known as Vichy, named after the spa town where the government of the so-called Free France was located and was operated under the French Army Marshal Pitain. In 1940, when the Germans divided France, and if you look at the map, you can see the blue being the free zone and the line between it and the occupied zone is the line of demarcation. So it ran east to west across the middle of the country and then turned south to run inland parallel to the Atlantic coast so that the coast and important inland agricultural areas remained occupied by the Germans. This brings us to the chateau which we visited, which sat on the line running north and south from the coast. If you look at the line, you can see near the bottom, or not far from where it touches Spain, there's a village called Hajetmo, and that's where I went to see the, the chateau. During the visit, being shown the chateau was in itself fascinating. Each room has been maintained by the family owners in accordance with the style of a particular epic. One room was decorated in the style of Louis Napoleon, and another held weapons and souvenirs from France's military involvement in Mexico. An owner of the chateau in the mid-1800s was one of the French military leaders at the Battle of Puebla during the French-Mexican War. His banners joined the other historical items in the chateau, even though they represented an extraordinary defeat of France by the Mexicans, which is still celebrated, the victory is celebrated on the Cinco de Mayo. As our visit was coming to an end, the family wanted to show us to the top or attic area, as the owner's father had been a talented miniaturist. He painted miniature paintings, and they wanted to show us his workshop and his work. As we admired the tiny paintings, which were remarkable, I saw just out of the corner of my eye a very unusual object, a large sign written in German and French, warning Jews not to cross the line of demarcation. The sign in French and German chillingly described the type of person who would be considered a Jew. This is a rough translation of the sign, warning to Jews. It is forbidden for Jews to cross the line of demarcation in the occupied zone of France. The following people are considered Jews those who belong to or used to belong to the Jewish religion or who have more than two Jewish ancestors in the generation of their grandparents. Grandparents are considered Jews if they belong to or used to belong to the Jewish religion. Any infraction discovered will be punished by imprisonment or a fine and property may also be confiscated. The sign states that anyone who matched this description of a Jew could not cross the line of demarcation beyond which was the route to possible escape and freedom. We asked the owner about how he came to have the sign, and he told us that over the decades, his family would store things in the attic rather than throwing anything out. He explained that this sign had been placed on the line of demarcation, which ran just in front of their house, and it had been placed there by the Germans as a warning to Jews. And the, when the war ended, his father removed the sign and placed it in their attic where it had remained. He also told us in addition that he was a, when he was 14 year old during the occupation, he had a job of letting someone know when the lady in the house on the other side of the demarcation line had her kitchen curtain open or closed, as this was a signal to indicate if it was safe or not to try an illegal crossing of the line. When we left, they told the friend with whom I had come that that song belo belonged in a museum, but I couldn't just ask them, please give me that sign which had been sitting in their uh, attic. My friend said he'd get it for me. He was certain he would give it to me for free from the, because no one would want to profit from the Holocaust. It was close to true. We were asked to pay the family's taxes in exchange for the sign. They didn't profit from it, but they were relieved of a small debt. They then had the sign boxed up, shipped to the United States. Here, customs charged us no fees because of uh, what they learned was it, were the contents of the box. And then it sat in our house, our game room, for several months. Frankly, it was unnerving to wake up every day, see the sign, and be jolted by the warning to Jews. This went on until the sign found its home in the Holocaust Center and out of our house. 
after that chance discovery, I decided to see if there were other important artifacts that I could find in France. Our friend was helpful again. He kept us an eye out for things that might be of interest. The first item that I'll show you is a form used by the Vichy government to require registration of Jews in the so-called Free France Vichy area so that Vichy would be able to quickly round up all Jews for deportation and ultimately extermination. As you can see, it's a form which also has a notice to Jews to be filled out by all Jews living anywhere in Vichy. The next one is a Star of David. This Star of David in yellow harkens back to the medieval ghettos in Europe. A few centuries later, during the Nazi occupation, every Jew in France was required to wear this star visibly attached to his external clothing, his jacket or his coat, so that it would serve the same purpose as the registration form, which you just saw a moment ago, to degrade, humiliate, and terrify Jews, assuring they could not escape. The end result of being arrested by the Nazis would be imprisoned in a concentration camp. The prisoners wore uniforms like this one while awaiting execution. I was able to locate this actual uniform used in the concentration camps in the city of Auch, which is a regional capital in the French province of Ligeres, not from the Pyrenees Mountains in Spain. This is a bowl which was used by the prisoners in the concentration camps. What you see now are two broadsheets from the 1870s of the song known as Le Juif Errant, The Wandering Jew. This song repeats the anti-Semitic theme throughout Europe at the time, that Jews were condemned to wander without a homeland for having rebuffed or struck Jesus on the way to the crucifixion. The Wandering Jew and other anti-Semitic tropes repeated over centuries were part of the basis for the deep-rooted hatred of Jews, which resulted in Kristallnacht in Germany, which we are commemorating today. When we showed these broadsheets to our friends in France, they were horrified. They explained that this was a cheery sounding childhood song they'd all learned without ever understanding its significance. I also want to mention the small town we uh, visit often. That, of course, before the pandemic, I could say we vis visited often. And it has a small uh, Holocaust memorial which was erected by a group led by teachers at a well-regarded ag agricultural high school in the area. It's interesting that this high school, this agriculture high school, is run by the same Roman Catholic religious community, the Salian brothers, which run the local, our local central Catholic high school. The teachers started an exchange pro program also with Israeli agricultural students. These teachers did a lot to raise awareness of the activities of the Vichy government in Gers, this region of France, during the war. And they had worked with the mayor to dedicate this town's Holocaust Memorial, their own small contribution to memory and to never again. Thank you. So I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in in the Q&A, and I would like to invite our participants to turn on your cameras. A number of these questions slash comments are about the film. So um, Catherine, I don't know if you had a chance to see any of these. Um, some of them are objecting to, uh, first there was a comment that suggested that it's not a true story, so a number have written in that it is a true story, uh, but participants have expressed a concern that this whitewashes Holocaust history, or um, one, one person writes, it reminded me of some of the films made in the 70s when World War II was often told as a romance or adventure. So. Do you have any thoughts on that comment, Catherine? Well, I, tr I tried to um, talk about this in my brief remarks at the beginning. Um, this is a, a film. It's a narrative. It's not a documentary. It's a film that is based on a true story. And I was um, actually impressed that they um, that they include that it was so that they really did take um, the love story between these two people and honor it and get as much of it um, in as possible. 
um, you know, starting from the beginning when, when um, Jean met him when she was a young girl, 16, um, throughout the, the rest of their lives and their marriage. Um, again, but going back to the challenge, which is do we only show films that show the horror of the Holocaust, the, um, uh, the graphic images, um, the, um, the devastation. And I think that it's important that those films are made also, but I, I don't think that um, there are many people that I've met in my years in my job that will not watch a Holocaust film for the reason that um, they don't want to see that. And so I would just say that I think it takes all uh, types of films. And if this is a jumping off point for someone to learn about some uh, an aspect of the Holocaust that um, they didn't know about previously, that then they might go and do some research and learn more about it. Then to me, the film has succeeded in encouraging, um, you know, education, um, difficult conversations. So um, I don't think that, you know, film is art and everybody has an, is entitled to an opinion. Um, and so that's, that's how I would respond to that, that issue. Yeah, I, I may weigh in too. Um, for me, it was, well, it, it motivated me to learn a little bit more about what was happening in France, because I know militarily what's happening in France. I know some survivor stories, but as one person comments here, you know, we could use a little bit more knowledge of French Holocaust history and who the important characters are. So um, I'll, I'll echo what Catherine said, that these resources are available to us now and um, we can learn more when we want to. One person commented in the Q&A that they appreciated the women's perspective. Um, not only Jean, but the women who are also waiting with her um, to, to visit their husbands or whatever the connection was who were imprisoned at the same time. I, I found it to be very interesting. There's also a comment about, you know, it, disbelieving that Jean and Bloom might not have known what was happening right over the fence. It is actually possible that they didn't know what was happening over the fence. We often look back on the Holocaust with the knowledge that we have and um, assume that people knew more than they knew. So, I mean, I can't say yay or nay, but it, it is possible that they were kept separate enough from that, that they did not know what was happening right next door. And I also think that it's a, um, a metaphor. Um, I mean, I, I think that, you know, oftentimes we um, today don't know really what's going on, even though with the internet and Twitter and social media, one might think we do, but I, I am always amazed when you just talk to everyday, you know, people, what they know about what's happening in the world. And so, um, I, again, I appreciated the film for the, the strong female um, story. Um, like one of our guests mentioned, it's a perspective that we see so, um, infrequently in films in general and specifically in Holocaust films. Thank you. So we just had a comment congratulating Jim Luco, Teacher of the Year. A lot of people are commenting anonymously. So this anonymous attendee says, Jim, that your passion is palpable and your presentation was informative. So I'll thank you again for doing that for us and for including quotes from people. It really it was a wonderful, informative presentation. So I'm watching to see what else comes in and maybe we'll just do a couple more questions. Okay, we have some. Um, and um, mentions the Val d'Iver, which is, um, I don't know. We have so we have Ed and we have David Rosenberg with us now. So maybe David, I can ask you to say a few words about the Val d'Iver. And pardon my French. Yours is both of you have much better French than I have. 
We need to unmute you, David. Unmute. There you so are. Can you, hear, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Well, uh, the, the Val de Ver was, was, uh, was the big roundup of Jews in Paris, July uh, 16th and 17th, 1942. And uh, they, they brought thousands of, of Parisian Jews into a, a cycling stadium. Uh, velodrome d'hiver the velodrome is a bicycle racing stadium and um, there they they were kept under atrocious conditions um, it was as uh, a couple of months after the um, deportations had begun from drancy the camp outside of paris to auschwitz and uh interesting i just add this note because i seem seem obsessively fixed on this town north of, of Paris, Amiens, that um, one of the things that I found out in finding new sources there was that there was also a, you might say, a little uh, echo of the, the uh, mass roundup in Paris in the town that I studied. And I found some documents that showed how they coordinated the roundup of foreign Jews, because that was more the focus of the, that period in 1942. The French Jews uh, were deported in 1944, um, but they, they started out, we have three classes, the refugees, the foreign Jews uh, who had come over a bit earlier and, the, um, and then the French Jews who were deported later. But, uh, but um, um, Sarah's key, is a, is a book that was quite popular not too long ago. And that tells the story of sort of the discovery of, uh, by an American journalist married to a Frenchman of the uh, reality of the Velodrome Dive Roundup. Uh, and, and one more point about that. In 1995, um, uh, Jacques, uh, Jacques Chirac, and then the president of the French Republic, um, uh, acknowledged French complicity in the destruction of many of France's Jews, over 75,000, um, and um, initiated a nationwide commemoration that celebrated uh, every year the first Sunday after July 1617 uh, around France. That's the end of my little Val Valdiv answer. That's really helpful. Thank you. And um, I, I think that we should conclude soon because we're at one hour, but um, let's see. Someone asked to repeat the name of the book, so I'll, I'll type that in. Sarah's Key. We have thank yous, Valdiv. We have one question. Maybe we'll conclude with this that's about the division of France. And so this connects back to the sign, Ed, that you discovered marking the line of demarcation. And the question is about why occupied France and Vichy France, if Vichy was a collaborationist government. And, and the question is, is it correct that Jews were safe in neither? Well, I'm going to defer to David as the historian, but I'll just give you my basic understanding of it. It, it was something which evolved. Uh, initially, uh, they were, would have been safer in Vichy. But there came a point when the Germans extended their uh, occupations to that area too, and as the uh, as Vichy became more vicious, in fact, they become it was became more and more dangerous. So it wasn't just something that totally happened over overnight. But in the end, as you can see by the form, in the end, uh, Vichy also cooperated fully. They were definitely a hundred percent in cooperation with the Germans. In fact, there's some in this. David may know that some of their um, uh, anti-Jewish discrimination laws may have even preceded the ones that the Germans implemented in the occupied zone because they were, you know, wanted to be really shown to be on their side. But there was a period of time that you could escape over the line of demarcation, maybe with help get into Spain or, or you know, and, and then escape. There were people who were able to escape. It became more and more difficult. But I defer, defer to David who's done a historic uh, analysis of the whole problem well I, well i think you've done a a, a good job i i basically uh I basically agree with what you said there ed um i just have an anecdote uh again connected with the town that i studied uh, one of the leading families there uh, 
tried to get its, um, uh, the, the father there uh, named Raymond Schulhoff, tried to get his family uh, over the line of demarcation uh, in 1942. And um, he, he got his, um, his uh, mother-in-law <clears throat> and two of his children. Um, the youngest one was accompanied by a, a person who was hired um, to basically, uh, they, they called it a passes, to, to somebody who takes other people across the line of demarcation. And they had got within uh, just a hailing distance of it in a little uh, uh, railroad station when the, when the Germans boarded the, the, the train and, and uh, found all these um, Jews with fake passports and um, so ar arrested them. Uh, eventually, he succe succeeded in getting his mother-in-law and his uh, two children out of the uh, transit camp that would have led them to Auschwitz. But uh, in 1944, uh, he himself was, was, was arrested and, and deported. Uh, it's interesting, the lady who, who tried to uh, sort of uh, be the passes, the, the person who, ca who got them, snuck them across the line of demarcation, uh, was, um, was uh, herself imprisoned in the town of Poitiers for two years, uh, where her husband desperately tried to get her out of there. Um, uh, one more, may I, want, may, may I make one more bibliographic uh, reference that, that would be helpful to people interested in the line of demarcation and this whole phenomenon of passing from one zone to the other? There's a book called Bag of Marbles. Um, and uh, I think that's a, an interesting, uh, interesting account of a family that, uh, of the children actually, who flee south from Paris, um, from Paris and cross the line of demarcation. It, it describes this process that Ed, uh, Ed was mentioning with uh, himself. So, so also a film, a film with the same title that we showed at um, J Film a year or two ago, and it oh. stars the same actress in a much smaller role. She played the boys, that really the, the young boys are the lead in the film, um, right. but she plays their mother. I just want to give one Pittsburgh anecdote, a very brief one that just came to mind. In the, uh, in the shady side, there's a BMW dealer, which is now part of some larger company, was owned by Germans. And there in Pittsburgh was a, one of the salesmen was Jewish. And I got to know him and he worked for these, this, these German people. And he went, used to go back to France every year to visit the family in the Alps that saved him and hit him. Okay, so he was hidden. Yeah, a French family, and he was hidden by them and, and protected. So the, the experience needs a lot more research like David is doing. There's a, a variety of, of uh, research uh, and, and uh, different, different experience people. But that's a Pittsburgh, totally Pittsburgh story, which I thought would be interesting. That's, uh, it, it just shows how connected we all are. And, um, and one thing that emerged from the film and from our discussion and from David's research is the tremendous movement of people, of Jewish people especially, that was happening in Europe, not only at the time that many of our families came here, you know, between 1880 and 1920, but throughout the 1930s. And that's how you find this community in France, which is not French, but arrives there before the refugees get there. So it's, it's an extensive and interesting and deep history that I agree needs more um, exploration and more study. And I want to thank everybody who joined us and especially our panelists for being with us for what I think was a very interesting and enlightening conversation. I just wanted and, to say one word. I hope I, that, yes, yes, please. I just please. wanted to c c congratulate James Lucott personally also for the wonderful work he's doing. Uh, I just wanted to put that on record so he would know. It's very much appreciated people by people outside of his uh, circle where he works. Congratulations. Excuse Thank me you. for interrupting you, Lauren. I'm glad you did. That was lovely. And yes, we're, we are so grateful to Jim and to the teachers who, who do this work every day. We talk about the LUCO effect. Jim, I don't know if you know this. This is when we have a huge program and there are all of these like, high school students there. 
And then we hear from other organizations who want to know, what's the secret? Like, how did you get all these young people at your program? And it's usually because Jim's students come. So uh, that was especially true when Father Dubois was here. And there's a wonderful picture of Jim and his students and Father Patrick Dubois. So yes, a much deserved, much deserved award. And thank you again to Edgar Snyder. I'm so glad you could be with us tonight. And to everyone who was on our panel, Catherine, best of luck with the festival. I look forward to seeing you there. And Jim, uh, may our work together continue. Thank you for everything you do.